Hello, welcome to the second in my series on narcotics. And as you know from the last series by narcotics, really what I mean is mostly the opiates, whether they're the pure opiates, the opium derivatives, or the synthetic opiates. Uh, a fascinating class of drugs with a long history and a very current uh, history as well. Some interesting stuff to talk about in the last lecture. In this lecture, uh, I'm going to continue and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know about the current use of opiates, a little bit about the pharmacology, just a bit, then talk about some of the acute and chronic effects of these drugs. So what do we know about current use of opiates? Well, when it comes to heroin, which is in many ways the most famous of the opiates, it's fairly difficult to measure. And it's difficult to measure for a couple of reasons. One is that heroin use is relatively rare you know, as compared to many of the other drugs that we have talked about and will talk about. And also that folks who use heroin for all sorts of reasons tend to be kind of on the margins of society. Um, not all of them, but many of them. Meaning, you know, if you're a heroin user, um, you're probably less likely to be regularly attending school, so you might be missed by the Monitoring the Future survey. Um, you're probably less likely than the average person to have a stable household or, or permanent address, so you might be missed by the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. So you know, with that idea in mind, that it's fairly difficult to measure, I mean, it's fairly difficult to measure all illegal drug use, but maybe especially so heroin use. With that in mind, let's take a look at some of our regular data sources. Here we have Monitoring the Future from 2010. That's about as far back as, or I should say as recently as Monitoring the Future tracked uh, heroin use. It doesn't look like they do anymore. Uh, but you can see among high school students, you know, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders, a relatively low use of heroin, you know, less than 1% um, of students, and uh, fairly low perceived availability. Um, I, I guess it's difficult to say how low is, is really low, but sort of, you know, 30% or, or less of high school seniors are saying that heroin is fairly easy or very easy to get. Now that picture changes a lot when we look at prescription pain relievers, especially the opiate uh, analgesics. Here there's much greater prevalence of these drugs, um, much greater prevalence of use. There's been more of a change in the rates of use in recent uh, years. And as I discussed in last lecture, there's a lot of concern about these drugs because they're more widely available, they're more commonly used, and they can have many or even all of the problems of the illegal opiates like heroin. So here is monitoring the future up to year 2014, which is their most recent published data. And you can see that the rates of use, and here we, they only measure in 12th graders for some reason, uh, the rates of use are higher and they've changed a lot, you know, from maybe a low of about 4% or a little bit less to a high of over, I don't know, let's say 9% in recent years and some ups and downs. Also the availability of these drugs is a fair bit higher. So instead of it being maybe 20 or 30%, it's upwards of 40% or higher of high school seniors are saying that these types of drugs are fairly uh, e uh, easy to get or, or very easy to get. If we look at the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, which their published data is dated to 2013, Look at heroin for the uh, entire population age 12 or older. The lifetime prevalence is around 1% or 2%, kind of depending on how you cut it. Um, not many people are reporting having used within the last year or in the last month. So it's it's not, I mean, gosh, it's not uh, uh, entirely unrare, or it's not entirely rare. I mean, I myself in my clinical practice have worked with people who have heroin addiction, so they are out there, uh, but they're not uh, that common, which is probably a good thing. But if you look over at the pain relievers, that's what National Survey of Drug Use and Health calls it, but this is the, the you know category of questions that refer to the prescription pain relievers, uh, including all the opiates and opiate derivatives and synthetic opiates that we've talked about. Here, the lifetime prevalence is upwards of 14% or so. And there are a fair number of people who've reported using these drugs within the last year or even within the last month. So a really big difference. Now, if you, uh, um, if you looked way back at the uh, Monitoring the Future um, uh, graphs that I just put up a few, uh, a few slides uh, ago, you'll notice that there's a slight decline in the rates of use uh, in the last couple of years. You know, over the last couple of decades, in general, rates of use of these drugs have been going up, but there was a little bit of a peak and a decline in the last 
you know, two, three years. Um, there has been a little bit of a decline recently in rates of opiate overdoses. Um, in part, we think, because of greater oversight that doctors are coming under, greater scrutiny, it's harder for doctors to write lots of prescriptions to, for these drugs. Um, the pills basically are getting harder to find. Also, as I mentioned in the last uh, lecture, uh, pharmaceutical companies, the, you know, the people who develop these medications, have been working hard to engineer new forms of pills which are just harder to misuse or abuse. So forms of OxyContin and similar drugs which are very difficult to crush up and snort, or if you crush them up, they form a powder that isn't water soluble, so it's very difficult to dissolve them and inject them or um, if you try to burn them to create a vapor to inhale, they have a much higher vaporization point. Uh, so there is a, you know, some hope that some of the problems that we've seen in the last couple decades are uh, perhaps declining a little, although it's kind of early to say for sure. But we've seen uh, in the same time period, roughly, an increase in heroin overdoses. So it's possible uh, that what's happening is there's some folks out there who uh, were or would be addicted or dependent on uh, prescription opiates, but are switching over to using heroin because it's becoming, relatively speaking, a little bit easier to get than some of those prescription medications. And having talked to healthcare providers in my community, that's Fargo, North Dakota, you know, talking to psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, dentists, pharmacists, and even um, also talking to some of the detectives in the police force, the sense that they are telling me is that, yeah, it used to be fairly easy for people to get uh, prescription pain medications and maybe, um, prescriptions were being written irresponsibly and people were uh, abusing the system to get drugs uh, to get high. Um, that's becoming a lot harder in our region, uh, but at the same time there's an increasing demand for heroin which is coming into our region, much of it traced back to Mexico. Um, that's a trend in a sleepy little Fargo, North Dakota, which is mirrored in other parts of the country as well. So some good news, I suppose, and perhaps some bad news as well. And if you look at the website for the Centers for Disease Control, they kind of back up these kind of uh, anecdotal impressions that I've had. So that's a little bit about the current use of opiates. Uh, again, the, the take home message here is that heroin, you know, kind of the most famous one, is relatively rare and the rates of use have been relatively stable over time. Um, however, for uh, other opiates, especially the prescription medications, their rates are higher and have changed a lot over time. Let's talk briefly about the pharmacology of opiates. And, um, you know, if you didn't guess or didn't know, this is a molecule or a schematic of a molecule of morphine. And in general, these drugs are all water soluble, um, means they're fairly easily absorbed into the body, either through the stomach, so people could drink, uh, you know, laudanum or a mixture that has opium or opiates in it, or they could take a pill. Uh, the drugs can be absorbed through the nasal membranes by crushing and snorting, as I said before. They can be absorbed through the lungs by smoking, and of course, they can be absorbed directly by injection. Um, in general, the faster the drugs get into the body, the quicker and stronger the effect, and also the greater the risk for overdose and uh, dependence. And I'll return to that point a little bit later on. Um, the point here is that there are different ways to get these different drugs into your body. In general, the ways that get the drugs in faster produce the more powerful effects. After that time, the half-life of the drugs is variable. Of course, it depends on the drugs. And as I mentioned in the last lecture, a lot of the legitimate pharmacological research that's gone on in the field of the opiates has been to tinker with their half-life, how quickly the body breaks them down and eliminates them. Because if you're using these drugs for legitimate purposes, like blocking pain after surgery, it may be advantageous to have a very long half-life so that the patient can take one dose of a medication and have protection from pain for many, many hours. Um, you know, it depends on what the purpose of the drug is. You know, if you have someone prepped for surgery, you may want a relatively short acting pain reliever because you only want, you know, the effects of the narcotic or, you know, the opiate analgesic to be lasting for a relatively short period of time. So it depends a lot. In general, though, as your book points out, the effects of these drugs are typically measured in the hours. So if you if you take uh, heroin or morphine or, or fentanyl or some of these other drugs, you're kind of on a trip for at least two, maybe four, maybe six, or even more hours, depending on the type of drug you took and how concentrated the dose was. With that in mind, let's talk about some of the acute effects of opiates. 
Well, um, the effects are variable, and that's arguably true of any drug that we can talk about. Um, but in the case of the opiates, it has a, has a lot to do with the quantity and the purity of the drug, especially if you're buying a drug on the street like heroin, which can vary quite markedly in how pure it is. So if you're buying um, you know, powder heroin, uh, it could be as little as 3% of real heroin is in it, and the rest is just inert material, hopefully, or it could be much, much higher than that. Uh, as I mentioned already, the effects depend somewhat on the route of administration that you're you're using, whether you're injecting or snorting or inhaling. It can depend on how long since you last used a dose of the drug and how tolerant you are of the drug. It can also have to do with the expectations that you have about the type of effects that you'll get. Um, some of these points would apply to any drug, but it's worth talking about them in the context of opiates right now. So let's consider injection of the drug, because at least in the case of heroin, that's in many ways the most famous uh, you know, way to use the drug. It's certainly the one that I think comes to mind if you say to someone heroin, they're imagining someone injecting the drug. Um, here, we typically see sort of two phases of drug effect. There's a relatively in sh short kind of period called the rush or the flash, where there's, there's a really intense pleasure, um, orgasmic in nature, just a really powerfully um, pleasant feeling. Uh, if you've seen the movie Train Spotting, which is based on the, um, well, it's not really a novel, it's more of a set of short stories uh, by Irving Welsh. Um, you know, it features people who are heroin addicts in Glasgow, Scotland, and one of them describes once say, the experience saying, you know, take the best sex you've ever had, multiply it by a thousand, and you're still nowhere close. You know, this idea of a, a sudden orgasmic rush of pleasure if you're injecting the drug. That's followed by a very long period of kind of dreamy, drowsy uh, sensation called the nod or being on the nod, which can last for several hours or even longer. Um, during this period of time, people report feeling very comfortable, very satisfied, like everything is right in the world, like um, you know, being hugged by someone you love, just all your worry is taken away. Uh, that you know, uh, seemingly just wonderful feeling to have. And of course, during that time, you have very little sensitivity uh, to pain, and you also could be in sort of a narcotic state of being in kind of a, a lingering dream where you're sort of fading in and fading out of your environment. In your peripheral nervous system, there are a couple of kind of interesting effects that show up. Uh, very famously, we have the uh, the pinpoint eyes. Someone who's on heroin will have very, very tiny pupils. I've seen this a couple times in person, and it's weird. Um, what this is evidence of is increased parasympathetic activity. If you think about your autonomic nervous system in the periphery, it's this balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic branches. Uh, normally, you know, sympathetic activation, that is to say kind of general arousal, is keeping your pupils fairly dilated so you can absorb, uh, you know, light and you can detect information visually in your environment. Uh, as that sympathetic, as the balance tips from sympathetic to parasympathetic, your, um, your eyes, in a sense, relax and close down to this very narrow uh, sort of pinpoint. In terms of other things going on in your periphery, there's this brief period of time where there's quite a, kind of quickened respiration during the rush, but then much, much slower respiration during the nod. This can even, of course, be fatal if someone is overdosing. Part of what can kill them is just their respiration becomes very shallow and, um, and kind of disorganized and not regular. Uh, blood pressure can lower a little bit as the person is uh, is uh, kind of going onto the nod, and they'll report feeling kind of warm, kind of relaxed feeling. Um, it's interesting to note that the that that kind of uh, rush and the nod experience really happens mostly around injection. If you look at someone who is snorting the drug, uh, it's more likely that they'll just get that kind of nodding, sort of pleasant feeling. They won't get as much of that rush that you initially get if you inject the drug. If we shift into the central nervous system, uh, a lot of what's happening here has to do with the fact that endorphin or that uh, opiates in interact with endorphin and caffeine systems within the brain. So these are the receptors in different systems of your brain which respond to endorphins and encaphalins. These are naturally occurring chemicals within your brain that have an opium opioid-like structure. Um, this is your body's way of, among other things, 
uh, rewarding you, uh, numbing pain, and doing a lot of other activities related to satiation. Uh, these same receptors will respond to opiate drugs because the molecules of the opiate drugs look a lot like those endogenous opioids and endogenous encephalins in your system. It's also worth noting that these receptors are widely distributed throughout your central nervous system, which in part explains why there's such a wide-ranging set of effects which take place when you use opiates. So to just briefly note, you know, in your hindbrain there's general decreased activity as your that part of your brain slows down, which in part explains the decreased respiration, decreased digestion, decreased sex drive. Um, in the midbrain, there's decreased activity, so decreased motor activity, decreased perceptions of pain. In the forebrain, there's kind of a powerful activation of the reward pathways, uh, with, which give you the feeling of kind of satiation, like the feelings you want or, you know, the feeling you have when you've accomplished something important or you've had a good meal or you've just had sex or you've done, you've just done something pleasant like hugged a loved one. That feeling you have which is like, ah, that's good, I, I did something good there. That feeling is very powerfully present uh, when you use opiates, which goes a long way to explaining why they can be so habit forming for people. With that in mind, let's talk about the chronic effects of opiates. Well, part of the picture here has to do with tolerance. And of course, with all drugs where we see tolerance developed, what happens is there's just decreased effect of a given dose of the drug if the, use, if the uh, user is using at that level repeatedly. And so in the case of opiates, what we see is generally a lot less of a rush for people, especially people who are inje injecting um, opiates. So that, that orgasmic pleasure goes away, uh, unfortunately. Uh, people describe, you know, trying to chase that feeling, or you sometimes hear a phrase which is associated with smoking opium of chasing the dragon, trying to like catch up to that initial uh, very pleasant feeling. And this, of course, can motivate people to use more of the drug than they initially uh, began using person stops using opiates, they'll go into withdrawal as they do for, mo for many drugs. And this will involve craving, which can begin, again, it depends a lot on the drug we're talking about, but within a few hours after the last use of the drug. And um, other symptoms that show up in the withdrawal syndrome can begin shortly uh, after the craving sets in. And this is, um, these numbers are probably not that, that precise or, or that accurate, but it depends a lot on the, the dose of the drug you're getting. And here I'm kind of thinking mostly about heroin. If you're using relatively impure heroin, the withdrawal syndrome can be relatively mild, you know, sort of like a, a, a bad case of the flu. If you're using a very strong opiate, the symptoms can be much, much stronger and much, much less pleasant. Um, here is uh, just kind of that a, a table with that basic idea that we've seen a lot before, the idea that the withdrawal syndrome for a drug is often kind of the dark mirror image of the, uh, of the active effects of the drug. So again, when someone's on, um, when someone's on opiates, although they have uh, subjectively a warm feeling in their, you know, they, they feel kind of warm and comfortable, they actually have decreased body temperature when they're withdrawing their body temperature spikes. You know, when they're uh, on the drug, their blood pressure drops. When they're off the drug, it increases. Um, you know, when they're uh, on the drug, they're constipated. When they're off, they can have really bad gastrointestinal distress and diarrhea. Again, if you've read the book or seen the movie Train Spotting, you'll be familiar with a, a particularly vivid and unpleasant ex example of that. Um, an interesting one here, uh, it missed on the drug, people have decreased sex drive and can, uh, males can be impotent. Off the drug, they'll have spontaneous ejaculation and orgasm, which is not at all pleasant, at least based on what people who've had that experience have told me. Um, and an important one is on the drug, people feel a sense of analgesia, you know, decreased pain, uh, things that don't hurt anymore, the world seems kind of soft and comforting. Off the drug, they feel incredibly uncomfortable, like everything hurts. And it's an interesting uh, point to make here uh, that often in movies and in TV shows and in books even, uh, withdrawing from opiates is, is portrayed as this absolutely harrowing experience that can be, that can be life-threatening. Like people feel horrible and they're climbing the walls and they just die from how bad the feelings are. Um, it's certainly the case that these symptoms uh, this general syndrome of withdrawal are very unpleasant, 
but uh, people don't tip, you know people don't die from withdrawing from opiates. They feel terrible, and that feeling of you know feeling terrible will motivate them to go back to using. But unlike say alcohol, where if you, you know, if you're a heavy alcohol user and you withdraw, you can die from the withdrawal syndrome. You don't with opiates. They're relatively safe, at least in that respect. Although they're very unsafe in a number of other respects, principally their 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 tendency for overdose or their risk for overdose. So anyway, as someone's trying to withdraw from using and they're feeling so unpleasant, there's a very high likelihood of relapse because of the two you know, basic processes we've seen all throughout the semester. There's positive reinforcement. So uh, you, know, you want to use the drug again because you want to pursue that positive, pleasant feeling. And there's a negative reinforcement because you want, you want to use the drug again because you want to get away from the horrible, unpleasant feeling of, um, of being uh, in withdrawal. And I'll link to a few videos on YouTube, some are from National Geographic, the others from the HBO Addiction series, that show um, some people in withdrawal and have them talk a little bit about the experience. And you get a sense of how powerfully motivating it is to go back to using, whether it's Oxycontin or Vicodin or Percocet or heroin or whatever, um, in an effort to get away from, from, those, uh, from those bad feelings. Uh, why do we do? Re why do people have relapse? Another factor, and we've talked about this before, is is uh, you know the learning that takes place, the association uh, between using a drug and all the different cues in the environment. So you talk to people who have used uh, heroin by injection regularly; they'll talk about. Um, you know, seeing a spoon or seeing a needle and having this strong craving response because those are two uh, uh, pieces of equipment that they've associated, of course, with using their drugs. More common things are, you know, being in the neighborhood where they used to buy the drugs or being among the people who they used to use the drugs with or it being payday so they've got money and they can buy drugs. All those things which uh, would otherwise um, be innocuous are now for those folks connected with drug use and can trigger craving and can uh, can kind of prime them for relapse. So I mentioned earlier that, that in some respects opiates are not particularly dangerous, at least in terms of their withdrawal syndrome not being particularly dangerous, but in other respects they are very dangerous drugs. We think about the overall toxicity of using uh, opiates. Um, if you can avoid killing yourself with an overdose, um, they're not particularly hard on your body. Uh, you know, pure um, opiates uh, will tend to depress your respiration, and again, that can be fatal, but assuming that doesn't happen, uh, they're not particularly damaging to your body. It's not like cocaine or amphetamines that jack up your blood pressure and cause your heart to have damage or you know, cause you to stroke out. Um, the problems with, with opiates tend to come, one, in that you can overdose on them fairly easily, two, in that they're frequently quite contaminated, uh, and that's especially true for heroin. You know, if you're buying heroin on the street, most of that powder you're buying is not the heroin itself. If it was all heroin, you might overdose and kill yourself. You could still do that even if it's not entirely pure, but all that other stuff that's in that baggie, which you will then dissolve and inject into your body or even just snort into your nose, can be quite messy. So when people have done research on um, on opiates and, and looked at you know what is in uh, a bag of heroin, it's all sorts of stuff like bacteria, viruses, of course, famously people getting hepatitis C or HIV AIDS uh, from injecting drugs. Also, just weird foreign matter, just junk that is is mixed in by the drug dealer to extend his supply so he can sell more and make more money. Stuff which really has no business being in your circulatory system and can be quite damaging to your body. So it's you can imagine that, that if you could get pure, safely administered heroin, it would be manageable for many people to use if they could avoid overdosing. But the fact that most people who use heroin are buying it on the street means it's very, very dangerous. And again, uh, yeah, I'm sort of repeating myself here, but this, these adulterants, um, what are they? Um, they're often uh, other uh, narcotics or analgesics. You can imagine if you're a heroin dealer and you're trying to make more money, so you want to extend your supply, you could buy um, you know, over-the-counter analgesics like acetaminophen um, or you know, Tylenol and grind it up and mix it in with the powder. That'll give someone a numb feeling, which will be similar to, uh, to what they uh, you know, are expecting to get from their heroin. It could be strychnine, it could be you know, um, flour, baking soda, whatever. 
those combinations of drugs or just combinations of random stuff that make up the adulterants of a drug like heroin can be very, very dangerous. Um, also, of course, the unknown concentration of heroin in the supply is incredibly dangerous. Um, again, we see this clinically. I've talked to people who are heroin users over the years, and it's a, it's really like playing a game of roulette. Um, you just don't know initially when you buy how much of the real stuff is in there, and given the narrow margin of safety for heroin, it's easy to get a dose that's too hot, you know, that's to say too strong, and you overdose yourself with it. Again, uh, a repeat, I suppose, but uh, as I just said, a small margin of safety bef between what is an effective dose of heroin, given the type of experiences the user wants to have and what is a lethal dose. Uh, and there are plenty of examples uh, over the years of musicians, artists, etc., who have overdosed and died uh, from heroin. Um, I suppose I'm dating myself a little bit, but being uh, someone who came of age in the 1990s, I think back to Lane Staney, the uh, uh, leader of Alice in Chains, uh, died of a heroin overdose. So that's, you know, an ex I remember when that happened. That was sort of an example, rather vivid in my recollection, of a heroin overdose. Another factor that's related here is, uh, you know, conditioned behavioral tolerance that can take place. Um, I've mentioned this in previous points in the, the semester, but just to briefly return to it, um, because of opponent processes that take place in your body when you use any drug, um, you become more, you can become more tolerant to a drug if you use it repeatedly in the same environment. So if I always use heroin and I, in the same way, I buy it from the same person, I use it in the same apartment, uh, unbeknownst to me, as I'm going to those places and buying the drugs and starting to use it, my body is getting ready to counteract its effects. If I then go and use heroin in a new location or from a new supplier, even if it's actually the same dose of heroin, the lack of preparation that my body has, the lack of early warning, can make that same dose now a lethal dose. And so there are, again, examples of people we see clinically where they use heroin for a long period of time and then use it again and overdose and die. Um, there's been research on uh, sort of uh, following people who have used heroin and other opiates over time, um, and there's plenty of evidence for the addictiveness of the drug. There are clearly some people who can stop using uh, opiates, as there are people who can stop using um, any drug, really. You know, not everyone gets addicted, but what we see with the, in the case of the opiates are that even users who achieve relatively long uh, periods of abstinence can often relapse. And this relapse can be very dangerous because if you're relapsing and going back to using a drug and you've lost your tolerance because you've been away from it for a while, you can easily overdose yourself and die. Um, it was a year or two ago, the actor uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who I think probably many of us have recognized from different movie roles that he's had, uh, died from an overdose of heroin uh, and he had been abstinent apparently for quite a long period of time and his friends and family thought that he had kicked his addiction to opiates but then apparently relapsed, used perhaps at a level that had previously been tolerant to and uh, died as an overdose, so, so quite sad. Um, all right, well with that somewhat sad note, I'm going to wrap up this lecture. As a preview, next time round we'll be talking um, in one or two lectures, I haven't quite decided yet, about marijuana. This will be our last lecture series of the semester. So uh, thanks for sticking with me all this time. I hope you found some of this stuff interesting, as, as I have. As I always say, thank you for your attention. If you have a chance, take a step away from the screen, the tablet, the computer, whatever, and uh, relax and enjoy the day a little bit. And then when you're ready, come back, because I'll have some information online for you on Blackboard or YouTube. I'll have some other lectures for you. Um, thanks so much. I'll see ya.